I preached, I preached last night, if you guys can be seated if you would like. If you want to stand, you can stand with me, but uh, the Terminator's going to stand. Um, I preached last night at Back to Life Church where Troy White pastors uh, in Coffeen or outside of Coffeen, and it's a Saturday night in the middle of summer, and so there was more people showed up than what I thought, and so I thank them for being there, and I know this is a Sunday morning but I want to thank you for, for being here because there is a lot of things during the summer that you could be doing. But if you're here, obviously, this is priority. And uh, I, I believe God honors that and sees that and sees your hunger. And so I just want to honor you and thank you for being here. And I would uh, even say that I don't think there's a better place that you could be. Amen. And, I, and I'm not just meaning Catch the Fire Church, although I'm thankful that you're here. But there's no substitute for getting together with brothers and sisters in the Lord. There's no substitute for the encouragement that it brings, the uplifting that it brings. And if you're a believer, then we have the, the Spirit living on the inside of us. And so I believe that no matter where I go, Jesus is with me. You're hearing me. But there's something different when we get together. And God shows himself and reveals himself. It's important in his word. The apostles, Jesus, spoke highly of, of meeting together. And so uh, thank you for being here. I'm happy you're here. I'm excited to, to preach. Are you guys ready to get into the word? Good. I have the Terminators excited. I have one person excited with me. Are you ready to get into the word? I'm turning into my dad, getting people excited, huh? It's summertime. I do want to say this. It's summertime, and uh, I was talking with Matt and, and Michelle before service and just how we're excited about the weather, and it's been a little too hot and, uh, and humid and muggy, but I'm happy that it's, it's not cold and rainy. I'm thankful for the sunshine, and I just want to say I have a prayer request for my baby sister, Mackenzie, because she got sunburnt the other day. And uh, she's tan, she's really dark skinned, and so she's not used to it. She's not tough like me because I just, I'm, in the summer, I'm, I'm sunburnt more than I'm not. You, you know what I'm saying? Are there any pale people in the house? I get, we're the ones that really need the prayer, you know? So, yeah, be praying for me as we're getting into the summer season. And uh, I'm red all the time. Praise God. All right, if you, if you want to read with me, turn to 1 John where I'm going to read. I, I believe we'll, we'll have it up on the screen if you don't have your Bible. If you do, then God's more happy with you. I'm glad you laughed because if not, that would have been weird. First John, I'm going to start reading. It's in uh, chapter 1. I'm going to start reading at verse 5, and then we're going to read to verse 10. So starting at verse 5. This is the letter from John, the apostle, that would have been circulated around uh, the different churches at the time. This is the message that we heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light... We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just. How many of you know that the Lord is faithful and just? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, if we try to cover it up and hide it, if we hide from Him, we make Him a liar and His Word is not in us. I've titled this message, Walking in the Light. Walking in the Light. Let's pray one more time. Lord, I thank You so much for Your presence in this place. God, I thank You that You're real, that You speak to us. And God, that's what I ask for today. I ask, God, that You would speak to Your people. I ask, God, that You would draw hearts closer to You. Lord, I pray that you would convict us. I pray, God, that you would sharpen us. I pray, God, that we would be encouraged in your presence. And I pray, God, that we would find freedom from sin. I pray, Lord, for, for people in this place, God, freedom from addiction. Lord, I pray freedom from shame, freedom from, from past guilt. 
Lord, we know that your word, your spirit can cleanse us from a guilty conscience. And God, I pray that we would be purified today. God, I pray that you would wash us, wash us and cleanse us. That's what we ask for in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. 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 So how many of you know what it's like to be told something and not be able to believe it just because of the person that's telling you? You know what I'm saying? Don't start pointing around at people. But I think we all know what it's like to hear something or, or know someone that when they're telling you something that you just can't trust them. You can't believe what they're saying. And sometimes they, they just may be a liar, you know, some people just lie a lot, or it may be uh, that someone is just a, a joke and you can't believe anything they say. I said last night I preached at uh, Troy White's, and many of you know Troy White, you can't take that guy serious, because everything that he says, everything that he says, he's joking, and he'll call me on the phone, and he'll, he'll say something, and I wait for him to react. Like, I wait for him to laugh before I laugh if he's, if he's joking. You've obviously never had a phone call with him, or you know what I'm saying. He'll say something, and he'll sound serious, and I'm like, do I say yeah, or do I laugh? And so I wait for him, and then he'll go, ah, and then so then I know it's good to laugh. But uh, I think that was a pretty good impersonation of, of Troy White. I hope, is this being, this is, this is live, this is, I'm going to send this to Troy and, and have him uh, rate that, rate that impersonation. That's not my notes, I don't know why I'm saying that, but uh. We know what it's like to not be able to believe someone or trust someone or when they say something, you know you can't believe them. I have an older cousin. His name is Dennis. We call him Dennis Wade. Many of you, if you're from around here, you probably know him. And if not, I'm going to give you a description. When you see him, you will know him. He looks like Charles Manson. He's got long, dark hair. I'm not even kidding. Am I right, guys? He really does. He's got long, dark hair. Sometimes he has like a, a scraggly beard. And most of the time, he's wearing some sort of uh, camouflage and uh, cut off jeans, what, whatever. I don't know. He's just a redneck hippie. I don't know. I love him, but uh, it's, just, it's just who he is. But I have learned in my 21 years of being on this earth that I cannot trust him when he tells me something. And I'm not calling him a liar. I'm just saying he's always messing with me and growing up he was always telling me stuff trying to get me to believe stuff trying to talk me into stuff that I probably shouldn't do I learned my first cuss words from him when I was four years old he's been a great influence on me um, but one time at a, at a family Easter at the Conways I think I was around four or five and uh, he's older than me he's in his, he's 30 or early 30s, and so he'd have been around a teenager uh, while this was taking place, and we had this, this family Easter, and so the younger grandkids always hide on the inside while the older grandkids went out and hid the Easter eggs. Does anybody's family do that? You know, okay, grand, my, my grandpa George, that's still my family, so um, nobody else's family does that. Anyways, my, the older cousins would go and, and hide Easter eggs, and so Dennis got me alone and, and told me where he hid all the, all the Easter eggs, where all the best ones were. And he told me that all the other cousins would be running out in the yard finding little ones, but the big ones with all the good stuff, probably money or whatever, I don't know what all he said to me, were out in the, in the horse pasture, right, in the horse field. And so, and he had them buried under mud, right? And so, uh, when, when we break, when, when we break to run out and, and hunt the eggs, all the other grandkids are going to, into the yard, and I book it, I'm booking it for the, the horse pasture. And so I think I'm hitting the jackpot because I'm digging through all, all the mud and uh, finding all, all these good Easter eggs. And so I come back, and uh, I, I don't think my mom was very happy because I was covered in, it turned out to not be mud if you didn't catch on, but it was uh, manure or animal product or however you want to word it. Um, in, that same, in that same pasture, around that same horse fence. Uh, one time he convinced me to pee on the fence, which turned out to be a hot wire fence. And so, um, yeah, sometimes I just say this to not to gross you out, but just to say that sometimes you can't believe someone when, when they're telling you the source of the information that you're hearing is very important. The source of the information that you're getting is, is, is very important. Some people, on the flip side, if they tell you something, you know that it's true because you know their character. You know who they are. 
And if you know our Jesus, you know His character. You know He'll never lie to you. He'll never lead you astray. You can trust what He says. The source of the information is important. Who you believe is important. What you believe is important. And this is probably not going to come to as a surprise to any of you, but we live in a world today, I know I'm stating the obvious, but we live in a world today where people don't know who to believe. People don't know who to trust. If you don't believe me, turn on the TV and you'll, you'll watch a news station and it'll be saying one thing and then you turn it to another channel and they're claiming to have the truth. And they're saying something completely opposite and so something's not adding up. Right? The, both of those things can't be true. And the things that we find in the Word of God and the things that we find in the world, they both can't be true. There's one standard of truth, and that's a big issue I think that we have in the world today is the struggle over truth, over finding the truth. And so there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of confusion. A lot of people in our world today are confused, and the Lord is not the author of confusion. But we live in a world where a lot of people are confused seemingly don't know right from wrong and I think that in this confusion that there's a a frustration that leads us that leaves people to almost just wanting to give up and say I don't even know if I can know what's real I don't even know if I can know what's true I've been through that honestly with um not with not with the word of God but just the the political spectrum you watch stuff and you're just hearing stuff all the time and people are arguing and claiming things and it's like I, I don't even know what, what's I don't even know what's really happening, right? I don't even know what's what's really true. People at my school, I don't know what I, this stuff's just coming to my head. People at my school, um, fellow believers that are are just very confused and feel like we do, we can't even know we can't even interpret or understand what the word of God is saying. That that's the enemy. That's the work of the enemy in our world today. There is truth. There is a truth. There is the truth. And so our world preaches that truth is relative. The society, the culture that we live in today, my generation, the 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 younger generation. I'm not calling you guys old, but uh, my generation. Um, say that truth is relative. And what I mean by that is, is, is truth changes depending on the situation or the circumstance that you're in. Or truth is whatever you want it to be. People talk about my truth or, or your truth as if there are different standards of truth. There is one truth. And I'm not claiming to have all the answers. I'm 21. I know I don't have everything figured out. But I do know Jesus. And I know that He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets to the Father except through me. He, he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. So I may not have all the answers, but I can point you to the one who is the answer. I, I'm not ashamed to say that Jesus Christ is the answer to the problems that we see in our world. The message of the Gospel is the answer to the questions and to the issues that we see even in our world today. Jesus Christ is the truth. The truth is revealed in Him. He came to reveal us the truth. He came to reveal us the way to life and life more abundantly. He came to give us life and life more abundantly. He came to reveal God. He was God manifested in the flesh. He is the source of truth. In a world that, that says we can't even know the truth, the truth came and revealed Himself to us. And He's still revealing Himself today. He is the source of truth. He is the, he's the one who defines truth. Our God is the one who, who defines you and defines me because He is our Creator. He made us. He gives us purpose. He gives us life. He gives us destiny. That's why John wrote this letter and we didn't read it in verse 1. But he started out in this letter and he said, that which was from the beginning, which we have seen with our eyes and looked upon and touched. This same John wrote the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus was from the beginning. That which was from the beginning, they saw Him, they touched Him, they were around Him. That which was from the beginning, He is God all alone and He created 
Everything that came into existence was made through Him and for Him and is unto Him. He is God. He is the definer of truth. He is the definition of love. He is the definition of goodness. He's God all alone. He was from the beginning and He came and proclaimed this message. And this is the message that we heard from Him and now proclaim to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. That's the message I'm hoping to preach today, that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. God is is light. He, He is good. In a world today that tries to portray Him as a monster and as a tyrant and as judgmental, we serve a God who is love. He's a God of peace. He's a God of justice. He is perfect. You know what I'm saying? Can anybody testify and agree with me that our God is perfect? His will is perfect. He has no flaws. He doesn't have a bad day. He doesn't change His mind. And when He says something, He means it. When we read something in His Word, He meant it. It it hasn't changed today. Our God remains the same. He never changes. His Word never changes. And so if it was true then, it's true today. If it was a sin then, it's a sin today. Our God never changes. The truth never changes. So in a world where people are trying to manipulate the truth to fit their narrative, there is one truth, and His name is Jesus. And He never changes. I I don't know if you do, but I believe the Bible when it says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I think we should be comforted in that. Knowing that His love has never changed. Knowing that this week when when you slipped up and said something or thought something or done something that you shouldn't have, that He does not love you any less now than He did then. I heard a man that I respect and I love say that God does not love you if you are living in sin. And I disagree with that. Sin is serious. I'm not going to condone sin. And we're going to get into that in a minute. We, We ought to take sin very serious. We should not take lightly something that is coming after our souls. Sin is serious. But God's love for you does not change. His love remains the same. And the Word says that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not height nor depth. It went dead. Can you hear me now? All right. He never changes. He's consistent with His character. And that means He's always good. And He's always God. He said, I'm God and I change not. He's always good. Even in conviction, He is good. Even when our flesh feels uncomfortable, He's good. Even when He is asking us and calling us to change something in our lives, he is good. He is always good. He never, he never changes. He's always good. He's always just. He's always holy. And He is all of these at the same time. Because He's perfect. And our God is, is love. Our God is good. But even in His goodness, he, He's holy. He's holy, holy, holy. The Bible has to say it three times because that's how holy our God is. Holy, holy, holy. There's no one like Him. There's no one beside Him. And in His holiness, our God cannot coexist with sin. And so when people say, you just got to love me how I am or accept me how I am, part of that's true because as Christians, as followers of Jesus, I believe Jesus loves everybody. We're called to love everybody. But God, in His holiness and in His justness and in His righteousness, He cannot and will not coexist with sin. That's why, that's why there is a place called hell. 
God did not make hell for human beings to live in. People have this distorted mindset thinking that when God gets mad at you or when you're not good enough, that when you die, God's going to send you to hell. And so you better live a good enough life to make it to heaven. For one, none of us are good enough to make it to heaven. The Bible says none of them are good. No, not one. There's only one who was good. And he paid the price for all people who would come to him. He cannot coexist with sin. That's why there's a place called hell. Because he is so good and he made us good. He made us in his image. He wants to have friendship and fellowship. He wants to have eternity with us. And that completely blows my mind. And I am in awe that a God so good wants to be with me and wants to be with us. But he loves us so much that he wants to be with us. But sin separates us from him. Sin brings death. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. That means the, 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 what sin leads to is death and destruction. And what God has for us is life, and I said it earlier, life more abundantly. So in his goodness, he cannot coexist with sin. He wouldn't be a good God if he was okay with evil in the world. We can all agree, we can look around at our, our world today and we can, we can say that there is evil in this world. And a good God will not tolerate or coexist with sin, even in our own lives. He wouldn't be a good God if He did. He wouldn't be a good Father if He allowed us and just let us and was lenient and, and was okay with us living in something that tore us apart. Because we see things that in our flesh entices us and we think is fun and we think is fulfilling and we think makes us happy when God's truth, God's word says that it leads to death and it leads to destruction and so it's not going to fulfill you. It's not going to make you happy, maybe for a season, but then it flades and it's feeding true joy, true fulfillment, true happiness only comes through living in obedience to the word of God. Amen. So God is not withholding good from us. In his goodness, he will not tolerate sin. Tolerance is a big word today because we have to tolerate everything. But we're not called to tolerate everything. We're called to, lo we're called to love everybody. But tolerating, if, if I was doing something to harm myself and my dad knew it and just let me do it in the name of tolerance, that would not be love. God is love. He is truth. He is the way to life, and he is the definer of goodness and life. So if he says it's wrong, it's wrong. If our truth disagrees with his truth, newsflash, we're the ones that need to, to think about this. We're the, we're the ones that need to change something. We're the ones that need to bow and surrender to God Almighty because he is the definer of good. He's the definer of truth. He is the definition of love. He's the definition of goodness. He would not be a good father if he let you live, some, live in something, continue in something that, that was tearing you apart, that was leading you to hell, that was separating you from his goodness, that was separating you from his blessing, that was separating you from experiencing joy and life that he created you to live in. He will not tolerate sin. And even though it makes us uncomfortable, and even though sometimes in our flesh we don't like it, I am thankful that he's a God of justice. I'm thankful that he is a righteous and a holy God who purifies us and calls us to be holy even as he is holy. Which is why we read and John says that we cannot have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness. We can't have friendship and intimacy with him while at the same time we're going directly against his will. The path that he has laid out for us, he said, I am the way. If we reject that, how can we expect his blessing? We can't say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness. We can't say we have fellowship with him and expect his blessing on our lives if we reject his word. If we deliberately disobey, if we deliberately run from his call to lay our lives down, 
even when it doesn't make sense to daily take up our cross and to follow him, if we deliberately disobey and reject that, we can't say that we have fellowship with him. We can't say that we know him. We can't expect him to bless us if we will not let go of the sin in our lives. And that's every, that's every single one of us. I'm not exempt from this because I'm the one holding the microphone. We can't say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. Because if we hold on to the things in our lives that he's telling us to lay down and to sacrifice and to give up because it's not good for us. He's not withholding something good. He's telling us it's not good, so let go of it. We can't say that we have fellowship with him and hold on to it. John says that we make him a liar. Basically, we're saying we don't trust that he's right. We don't trust that he knows better than me. Because I want it. And I think it feels good. And I want to I, I continue in it. I make him a liar if I deliberately disobey and reject the truth that is revealed in Jesus. And honestly, that's, some, that's scary words, to make God a liar. And we know he's not a liar, but John is just warning us. You, you're, it's like you're making him a liar if you disobey. And that's pride saying that we know better than him. We cannot reject his word. We cannot reject his will. We cannot reject his way and then experience and expect to experience life and joy and peace because that is only found in Jesus. And if we truly believe that, then I think we would be eager to obey him. We would be eager to surrender to his will. We would be eager to live in the way that his word directs our lives. We can't reject it and then expect blessing from it because God is light and in him is no darkness at all. He's always good. There's no darkness in him. He does not have ill will towards us. He does not want harm for us. God is light. What that means is, inevitably, it is his character, it is his nature to expose and to reveal. Once again, not to harm us, but to save us and to set us free. Because things in our heart, in the, the, the dark places in our heart that we try to hide or, or even forget... God comes and exposes and reveals and illuminates things in our lives that shouldn't be there. And that's why some people, I think, don't want to come to church. Because they start feeling convicted. And they start seeing things and, and God's showing them things because he's good. That's what he does. God is not distant from us. He's trying to speak to you if you would listen. He exposes and reveals things that shouldn't be there. Because he is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And so if we try to condone our sins, if we try to hide our sins, if we say we have no sin, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. But if we see the truth and accept the truth, Jesus said the truth sets us free. We read in 1 John where it said if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the answer then is not to continue condoning or hiding or trying to justify the sin in your life. We spend so much time and effort trying to justify where we're at rather than just simply receiving His grace and receiving His freedom and receiving His liberty and just surrendering and handing it over to God. We can't justify our sin and then expect to be justified before Him. The answer is not to run and hide and condone and justify and try to hang on to what we know is, is pulling us away from Him. The answer, John says, is to confess our sins. To confess our sins. And I'm not going Catholic on you. I'm not going to have you come up here 
and uh, confess to me everything you did this week. But I think you know, I hope you know what I'm saying. To confess, to be open, to surrender, to say, God, here I am in my mess. Here I am, you know my thoughts, you know my desires, you know my intentions. To confess our sins, to be open with Him. And if we truly know and trust that He is good, we would open up to Him. We would let Him in. It's out of fear and it's out of pride that we would try to run and hide. But the Word says that His perfect love casts out fear. Our God is is love and He loves you. And he wants good for you. And so the answer is not to hide or to condone, but to confess and to be open and to pour it out in front of Jesus because he cares for you. And, and he knows it anyways. It's not like he doesn't know what you're doing. You can't hide it from him. So you might as well tell him. And the promise is that if we confess our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And what the enemy tries to do and what we convince ourselves of is that we get into a place or in a sin or in a state in our life we're so bad that God can't love us. But the word says that there's power in the blood of Jesus to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I looked up that word all in the Greek, and it means all. All sin, all unrighteousness. Everything that we have done that has went against him, everything that we have guilt and shame for, there's power in the blood of Jesus. We don't just sing that song to make us feel better about ourselves. We sing it because it's true. There's power in the blood of Jesus to forgive us and to cleanse us. And Paul said that he can cleanse us from a guilty conscience. So even things that we have done in the past that you're not living in anymore, but it's tormenting you and you're trapped in your mind, there's power in the name and in the blood of Jesus to forgive you and to cleanse you. But the answer is not to hide it, but to confess it and to be open and to surrender to Jesus. I have one more thing that I want to say, one more thing I want to look at. And it's in John 13. You can look at it with me if you would like. If not, I'm just going to look at a couple verses. But this is the same author. We read 1 John, which was a letter. This is the Gospel of John. And he's giving account of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And there's a lot of things that we do in the physical but it's symbolic and it's spiritual and it has an even deeper meaning than we even realize. Jesus was not just washing their feet. He even says here in John 13, verse 7, he said, what I'm doing now, you don't don't understand now, but afterward, you will understand. Sometimes Jesus does things that we don't understand or comprehend, but we just have to trust him and allow him to have his work in our lives. And he's telling his disciples you don't understand what I'm doing right now, but, but one time you will. One day you will. And I'm kind of stealing this from one of my dad's sermons because he preached this one time um, about cleansing and washing. But in, in John 13, verse 8, Jesus says, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. We can't say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. If I do not wash you, You have no share with me. You don't have fellowship with me. You don't know me if you don't let me wash you. And then verse 10, Jesus continues and he says, The one who is bathed, the one who is completely washed, does not need to wash except for his feet. Except for his feet. So I read this or I thought of it. I think the Lord reminded me of it. And I thought it was interesting because what we read in, there in 1 John and what I've been preaching about that the blood, uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to forgive us and to cleanse us. It goes hand in hand and right along with what Jesus says here in John 13. If you have been washed, you don't need to be washed all over again. 1 John, in light of all this, John is writing and he says, 
the, that if you confess your, our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. That word forgive is past tense. What that means is if we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and surrender and repent and receive the free gift of salvation that only he gives, we are forgiven and we are justified once and for all. When the blood cleanses you, there's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. If you are forgiven and you are justified, the word says that the, that the Lord, the spirit, the blood is strong enough to keep you to protect you, to keep you unstained in this world. Jesus says that if you've been washed, you have been forgiven. That's an encouragement. We, are, we stand forgiven. We stand justified. If you have received Jesus, we ought to have confidence and assurance in his goodness. The assurance of salvation, the assurance and the hope of glory, which is Christ in us. If you are forgiven... Once and for all, Jesus was the sacrifice for sins. But then Jesus says you don't need to be washed except for your feet. And 1 John says that he forgives us, but he also cleanses us. That's not past tense. That's an ongoing cleansing. That's sanctification. So when we receive Jesus, we're justified. What that means is we're right before God, but then he's still sanctifying us. What, what, what I'm saying is God's not done with you. you he's not going to leave you where you're at if you will surrender and obey and live according to what he is calling us to. He will cleanse us and sanctify us. And when you walk around on this earth, your feet get a little dirty sometimes. But Jesus does not want to leave us there. He does not want to leave you there. There is power in the blood of Jesus to forgive you. So if you're in this place and you, not ha you have not received Jesus, don't walk out the doors without doing that. There's power in the blood to forgive us of our sins and then also to continually cleanse us. We can stand justified and we can be sanctified in the blood. I'm closing with this, so I would like to invite you guys to stand with me. I'm preaching that Jesus is good enough and there, he has power enough to save, to set free, to deliver, to wash us from all unrighteousness. And if you're in this place, you're either in one of these two camps. So this is for everybody. So I'm not going to have everybody come forward. If you want to, please do. I'm going to pray over everyone all at once. But I'm going to kind of split this up a little bit. All of us are in one of these two camps. Either you're in this place and maybe you've been familiar with church, or you've heard about God, or, or in a way you've known Him from a distance, but you have never called on Jesus as God, as Savior, as Lord, as Master, and invited Him to come and take over your heart and to take over your life. That's the call. That's the call that we see in Scripture. It's not just a, I'm going to call on Jesus and then show up to church every once in a while. The call to salvation is the call to lay your life down before him. And if you have never done that, do not leave without doing that. And, I will, and while I'm praying, I would invite you to come forward and I want to pray with you individually because there is power to forgive you and to justify you before God. If you are in a relationship, if you do have fellowship with God, if you know Him, we all need continually cleansed. In this life, in this fallen world, there's evil, there's hurt. Maybe you're experiencing something that's separating you from God and it's not even your fault, it's, it's something that someone else did to you. But you feel stained, or you feel dirty, or you feel like there's a separation between you and God. The blood can cleanse you, cleanse you of a guilty conscience, and wa wash us. So I'm, I'm going to pray, 
over everybody. And what I want to do is I'm going to ask you to, to lift your hands because that is a, that is a physical sign of, of surrender. I said things that we do in the physical affect the spiritual. And when we lift our hands, we're saying, God, I need you. I surrender to you. And so I'm going to pray over everybody. If you're in this place and you have not called on Jesus as your Savior, while I'm praying, I I beg you, I ask you, please come forward. I want to pray with you individually. We're going to worship and have a song. It's not to make a spectacle, but God wants to free you and wash you. So right now, Lord, I thank you, Jesus for your forgiveness. I thank you, Jesus, for the mercy, God, and the grace that you offer us. I thank you, Lord, that you are so good that you don't leave us in sin. You are a good father, and you love us. And Lord, I thank you. I pray, God, that you would begin revealing your love to every heart in this building. God, I pray we would see you for who you are. I pray, God, that confusion and uncertainty, Lord, I cast that out in the name of Jesus. I pray for clarity, Lord. I pray for a confidence that only comes from your spirit, knowing that you, Jesus, are the way. You are the truth, God, and you are the life. And I pray, Lord, for every person, every hand that's lifted high right now, that we would begin experiencing life and life more abundantly as you have called us to. I pray, God, that you wash us right now. God, I pray you cleanse us with your blood. And Lord, I pray for those in this place that don't know you, that don't have fellowship with you. I pray, God, that they wouldn't harden their hearts. I pray, Lord, that they would surrender to you because the best thing we can do in this life is give it to you. We give it to you right now. God, I pray you wash us and cleanse us. We thank you, Lord, that you are faithful and just to both forgive us and to cleanse us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus.